Do your kids or teenagers ever have freak out moments? Whether you're a parent, a teacher, just someone who cares about kids, you won't want to miss this one. Let's get into it. Welcome back to the Natalie Tisdall podcast. Today, I'm thrilled to have parenting expert Carla Nomberg back on the show. Carla introduces her new book, How to Stop Freaking Out, aimed at helping middle-aged kids develop emotional regulation skills. In this episode, we're going to explore why kids' emotional buttons get pushed so easily, and we're going to share practical tips for managing stress and anxiety. Carla offers insight into the role of sleep, the impact of constant news and social media on all of us, and simple techniques like deep breathing and movement to help calm down. Perfect for parents, perfect for caregivers. This episode is packed with humor, empathy, and actionable advice. That's like what I like to give you. I'm so glad you've chosen to join me today for this podcast, and I hope it helps you, and I hope it blesses your family. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast where each week I bring you topics on faith, health, and family. Let's get going today with author and my friend, Carla. Carla, here we are again. You keep bringing me new good stuff. I'm so excited to be here. I love speaking with you. Well, I've enjoyed our friendship and getting to know you because I am so focused on kids right now, teaching and also yeah. podcasting on family issues. So the first time that we spoke, I think it was your last book, right? Yes. I, th I think we've spoken a few times, but this is a new iteration focused on a different market. So tell me what's behind it and what we're going to talk about today. So several years ago, you may remember, I published a book called How to Stop Losing Your Beep with Your Kids, right? How to Stop Losing Your Temper with Your Kids, um, but with the S word. And uh, it's really about emotional regulation for parents, because if I think a lot of your listeners, a lot of parents out there, um, all of a sudden, at least this was my experience, I really was never a yeller or a screamer. I really was a pretty calm, balanced person before I had kids. And then when I became a mother almost 16 years ago, I found that I was losing my temper and screaming and yelling a lot more often with my children than I kids, wanted they to. They push us to the brink, places oh, yeah. we never they, thought we would go. Buttons we never thought we'd have. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden they found them and they pushed them. <laughs> so that book was really about um, digging deep into why we lose it with our kids and what we can do to lose it a whole lot less. Uh, and then this new book that we're talking about right now is called how to stop freaking out and it is essentially the middle grade version of that book so the, i will say the previous book has some profanity in it obviously this one has zero profanity because this is for kids ages i would say about 8 to 12. and so this is a really fun full color book folks who are watching on youtube can see that we've got like awesome illustrations and it's really about teaching kids um, emotional regulation, how to notice when they're about to flip out, um, what flipping out looks like, what it means to flip out, why it's not a great idea, and then what they can do to calm themselves down and either prevent those freakouts from happening or recover more quickly when they do, as they will, because we're all human, happens yeah. to all of us. Yeah. Well, I, I love it that you took these things we learned in that first book. So let's get into a few of those because those are things that we can all do at any age, we have to recognize it first. Yes. So let's get into what some of those are to stop freaking out or losing your bleep. Yeah. So the way I think about it <clears throat> is that we all have these invisible buttons all over our body. And this was a metaphor I came up with for the first book, but it also works for kids as well. And the idea is that our thoughts and feelings and behaviors send energy to those buttons, right? So if we're feeling anxious, sad, scared, angry, confused, overwhelmed, those or if we're having thoughts like i can't do this i don't know what i'm doing nobody mm -hmm. likes me i'm never going to succeed at what i want um i'm a mess whatever these thoughts may be or if we're in something's going on in our body if we're in pain if we need to go to the bathroom if we're hungry if we're exhausted mm -hmm. anything like that is going to put a lot of power to our buttons and make them big and bright and really pushable and then something happens so with parents it's often you know anything from 
your kid throwing a ball in the house when you ask them not to, to your kid coming up to you at like 10 p.m. on a Sunday and telling you they have a science experiment that's due tomorrow, right? It's never happened or, in my family, ever. Oh, no, never. <laughs> or my favorite one is you ask your kid to put on their shoes 27 times and like literally this is a thing you have done every single day mm -hmm. of your kid's life mm -hmm. and they put on their shoes like five times a day and yet they, whatever. So these things happen. The shoes never get put on. Anyway, they never get sound <laughs> is my problem. <laughs> I don't even know why. Why is it the shoes? I'm okay. Like, I so, anyways, wear your shoes. I don't know. <laughs> okay, can continue. <laughs> you know, we have to wear shoes to leave the house. This is not a news flash after 15 years, right? Okay. So, anyways, when our buttons are big and bright and sensitive, and then something happens, anything comes along, the button is pushed, and we lose it, right? And, but if we're well rested, if we're not in pain, if we're feeling calm, if we're in a good mood, maybe your kid has to come along or your friend or your teacher or your parent or anyone in your life. They, they come up to you and they're ready to push that button or life is ready to push that button. Mm -hmm. But because your buttons are dim and calm and small, they're harder to find and they're harder to push and it takes a lot more pushing to get you going. Mm -hmm. So in this book, I want to introduce kids, first of all, to the distinction between thoughts, feelings, and behaviors, which is something that lots of adults don't really know, right? It's not something we're taught in school. Many of us don't know it. So I want kids to know the difference. I want them to understand. And part of this is just having the knowledge and part of this is kids kind of learning it for themselves. You need to get insight into your own particular situation. But kids knowing what lights up their buttons, what makes their buttons sensitive and real pushable, and then getting a sense of what in their life pushes those buttons. Um, and knowing what a freak out is, knowing what it looks like, and how to calm themselves down. So I walk readers through like all the information they need, and then it's just up to them to practice. Um, it's up to all of us to practice these skills that I teach them. What are some of the most common of those things? I mean, I feel like, and I think we talked about this last time. I know we've talked about it in the past. And now I'm working with high schoolers and I see it even in my middle school, children of my own and their friends, the, the level of anxiety, the things that I guess you could cause pushing buttons because, right, you push somebody's button, it causes anxiety, and then they freak out. Like, it's, there's this chain reaction. Why do we have so much more of that? So there's a couple things you asked there, and they're both great questions. The first one is why. Why are so many of us walking around with these big, bright, red, exposed buttons, right? Mm -hmm. We're walking around lit up like Christmas trees. Mm -hmm. And I think um, some of the issues are age old, and some of them... I think are pretty new and related to a lot what's going on right now. So let's let's talk about the variety. First of all, fatigue, exhaustion, lack of sleep, especially for kids and high schoolers. I cannot emphasize the extent to which this makes your buttons unbelievably pushable when you are exhausted. And for kids, there I think there are a couple of issues that are really keeping kids up late at night. One is phones in their rooms or any kind of technology. Um, and so one of our hard rules in our family is that the kids don't take their phones into their bedrooms. The end. That's it. They just, they can't be trusted with it. I can't be trusted with it, right? So no phones in the bedrooms. We also, our kids go to bed relatively early because they have to get up early for school. And I know in a lot of communities, especially with high schoolers, there have been pushes for later start times of the school day because teenage brains, this is not your kid's problem, folks. If you have a teenager and they want to stay up late and wake up late, that's how the teenage brain works. It's not something wrong with your kid. And unfortunately, society doesn't really accommodate that. But sleep deprivation and exhaustion will light up your buttons like nothing else. It's also, Natalie, you mentioned anxiety and sleep deprivation and exhaustion are 100% linked to anxiety. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we've all experienced this, right? That our anxiety really goes up when 100%. we're real tired. Yeah. Um, I think also anxiety is huge right now. And kids these days have a lot to be anxious about. The, the national and international news is pretty frightening. Climate change is, is very stressful, very frightening. And, you know, it used to be that we would get exposed to the news, what, once, like for half an hour at 6 yeah. p.m. every day? Maybe if you turned on the news at 10, you know. Appointment I mean, you... viewing instead of 24-7, right? Yes. Did you just say appointment viewing? 
Yeah, because I mean, I grew up in a household where, well, let's finding out what's let's find out what's happening in the world, you know, before going to bed. What's the weather tomorrow? Ten o'clock yes. news, or the six o'clock news, or the five That's o'clock. That's right. You know, that was my world. That was the world I lived in of of that schedule of news. And now nobody watches it's a, constant. for an appointment. It's it's on their phone all the all the time. I have never heard the phrase appointment viewing, and I love it. And I think it's exactly right that you know we weren't spending every waking hour being flooded with updates about all the terrible things happening yeah. around the world. We would turn on the TV, you know, if you were anything like me, mostly to watch the scroll at the bottom of the screen to see if my school was going to be closed for a snow yes. day. That was like, right. Right? right. That was the reason. Or what you were going to wear tomorrow with the weather. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. right. Mm -hmm. And you would get the biggest headlines. Mm -hmm. And now it's like one terrible thing happens to one person halfway across the world. And I don't mean to say that doesn't matter. Of course it does. Mm -hmm. Every person matters. But when we are constantly seeing that information pop up in our feed, and we think it's pretty benign, we scroll right through it, but it's not benign. It really sends just another jolt of power to our buttons every single time. Mm -hmm. And it's not just that, it's also the FOMO happening for kids, right? Mm -hmm. So um, it's kids, I mean, kids are starting to get phones pretty young right? And they're getting access to social media quite young. And, you know, we all knew what our kids were doing when you and I, what our friends were doing when you and I were kids, right? We knew if they were hanging out and stuff, but not the way they know now. They're yeah. constantly seeing what they're missing out on. They're constantly seeing what other kids are doing that they're not involved in. And it causes anxiety. It causes stress. And so anxiety and stress make your buttons huge and very pushable. Yeah. Um, and then there's just the day-to-day -day stuff. Like, you know, a friend ignores you at school or you forget your homework or a teacher snaps at you. All that stuff really builds up over the course of a day. And so often by the time kids get home, they're a mess. Their buttons are huge and bright and unbelievably pushable. And then we parents ask them to, you know, take off their shoes or something and they just lose it at us. And yeah. it's not it's not because we've done anything wrong. It's because they're toast. They got nothing left and we've been the one to push their button and they lose it. Yeah. Yeah. It's, you just made it so easy to understand. I mean, I see this visual now. I see my kids walking in and they're just covered in buttons. And so yeah. how do we dim those? Give me more ideas. How do we dim these buttons to just regulate them? Okay, so my readers know that I get a little cheeky with my acronyms, Natalie, because I sort of have it a helps. sense of humor. Like a nine-year-old. <laughs> I just want people to remind folks that this stuff is really serious, but we shouldn't be taking it too seriously. Mm -hmm. And I do think humor is a great way to calm down buttons in general. It's one of my go-to coping mechanisms. But <clears throat> so in my book, I talk about burps, which are button reduction practices. And basically, these are things that we can do over the course of a day, we can do them at any moment at any time, to kind of tone down the energy to our buttons to regulate our nervous system. And in the book, I actually I wrote out like the ABCs. So I, I have 26 very proud of myself for that. <laughs> um, and they go by the alphabet, because I want to reinforce the idea that this is, this is simple stuff. It's not always easy, but it is simple. So for example, this is going to sound like a cliche, but it works. A, a, a huge button reduction practice is taking some big deep breaths, mm -hmm. slow, big deep breaths. And the reason we do this, the reason this works is because when our buttons are all lit up, our nervous system is on high alert. It's ready to fight, flight, freeze, freak out, whatever it is. And when we take those deep breaths, it's like basically sending a text message to our nervous system saying, you're safe. Everything is okay. You might be dealing with some stresses, but really physically you are safe. You can calm down and then it really does just take it down a notch. Mm -hmm. Other strategies include, you know, and I talked about this in the previous book, it's not rocket science, but being reminded of how useful, um, moving your body, right? Our stress and anxiety often live in our bodies. So when we can move our body, whether it's going for a walk, doing jumping jacks, turning on your favorite song and moving around, walking up and down the stairs of your house, whatever it is, moving your body is often a great way mm -hmm. to kind of take some of the power out of the buttons. Um, for many people reciting a prayer, a mantra, um, song lyrics, a poem, like I have a friend who memorizes poems once a week and mm. just the act of memorizing this poetry has a way of focusing her thoughts because our thoughts are often huge triggers, right? Yeah. If you're walking yeah. around all day thinking about how your life is terrible and you're a mess and you have no friends and you can't do anything right, your buttons are going to be huge. 
Yeah. Right? Yeah. So if you can focus your thoughts using prayer, mantra, poetry, song lyrics, counting to 10, any of that is so much better than thinking horrible things. Yeah. yeah. So I have a ton of strategies in here, but what they all have in common is they move our bodies, mm. they calm our emotions, and they focus our thoughts. Which just sounds like so simple, like calm your body, move it. But having those very specific things that you've given just now is so helpful. So 26 yeah. months, I love that. Yeah. 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 So how is, how do you think it's different or is it the same for middle schoolers as it is in your first book? Like, are we doing the same things? Are you simplifying it for middle schoolers? Is it this, are we doing the same activities? So yes, the activities are very sim similar. One of the primary differences that I really want parents to remember is that kids don't have a prefrontal cortex. Mm -hmm. So this is the part of our brain that's right behind our forehead and it's kind of like the adult in your brain. It helps with planning, it helps with calming down, emotional regulation, thinking clearly, um, all of these kind of higher level adulting functions. And when we are freaking out, that part of our brain is essentially offline and it's our limbic system, which is the back of your brain, kind of above your, above your neck, sort of the base of your skull, that limbic system, which is where it, that's the part of our body that helps with our basic functions like breathing and, you know, heartbeat and all those things that need to happen. Mm -hmm. But also that's the part of our brain that wants to keep us safe. So that we're born with that right from the very beginning. That's the part that's running the show when we're in fight or flight mode, right? When we're freaking out. Mm -hmm. And so the crazy thing is that our prefrontal cortex isn't fully developed until we're in maybe our early mid twenties, which is why we have kids licking walls in public airports, right? We have kids doing all sorts of crazy stuff and you find yourself saying please don't put your hand down your pants before you come help me cook like now you need to go watch like the part of our brain that says hey kid don't do that is literally isn't there yet for kids mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right it's why we have college students also doing like i had friends who used to think it was really fun to set stuff on fire and throw it out the window mm -hmm. in college yeah. completely sober natalie yeah it's because this part of their brain yeah. literally wasn't there. Yeah. And so one of the big differences, and I don't go into this in the book because this is not the kid part, is that when our kids are freaking out, they need us to be their prefrontal cortex for them because mm -hmm. they don't have one yet. What does that look like? It means we need to stay calm for our kids in that moment. And boy, is that hard to do. So hard. So, so hard. Is there a companion workbook for the parents? <laughs> Yes, it's how spoke. to stop losing your beep with your yeah. kids. That's so the, it is. So yeah. are, you, are, you, are you targeting parents with this book to buy for their kids? And are you, are you thinking, okay, parent, read through this so that the kid knows how, or is it a gift to my niece? Is it a, you know, how can we best utilize? I guess that's my question. How can we best utilize this resource for middle schoolers? That is a great question. So... <clears throat> I don't know if your kids are anything like mine, Natalie, but my kids don't want to hear it from me. No. Doesn't matter what it is. Of course not. They don't we're, want to hear it from me. Smart. Who we're just parents. Right? Doesn't matter how much. And I love my kids. I have great kids, but they, they really don't want to hear it from me. And so what and they never really have. And so what I recommend for parents is if you think this book would be useful for your children, buy it. Read through it if you want. It's fun, or you can get the you know, you can get how to stop losing your with your kids. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There is some common language in there that you can, you know, you can use to talk with your kids, but please don't talk to them about it yet. Mm. So buy the book, uh, leave it out on the counter, leave it on the table, and don't say a word about it. And if your kids ask you about it, say, I don't know, I don't know, I'm not sure where that came from, and walk away. Like, don't discuss it with them, don't encourage them to read it, mm -hmm. because the minute you do, this is no it's longer about cool. the book, mm -hmm. this is about the parent-child dynamic of power struggle, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. If they pick it up and read it, and I've, you know, we've done some testing with kids, they seem to love it, so I'm, I'm thrilled, that's the most important thing. And they wanna to talk to you about it, that's great. Then talk to them, read it, discuss. But if they don't wanna talk about it, don't bring it up, right? We are, yeah. we are planting seeds with this book, we are giving kids ideas they can use on their own. A big part of this book is empowering kids mm. to do this on their own, to really take ownership over this experience, take ownership over how they respond to their thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. And the minute the parent gets involved, it's not cool anymore. I know the dynamic is gone. Like yeah. you've lost that. So, um, 
also with with both of my books how to stop losing it and also how to stop freaking out i really don't recommend people give these as gifts as much as i would love that but i wouldn't want to be on the receiving <laughs> end of this book way. <laughs> so if you feel compelled to share this with someone what you can say is if it's true hey i read this book and it really helped or my child read this book and they really seem to like it so maybe if you feel like it you can check it out but i've, I've been to too many book signings where well-meaning mothers and mother-in-laws mm -hmm. say i'm gonna buy this for my daughter and i say please don't i would mm -hmm. love to sell you a book but don't don't do that <laughs> like um because because we, we don't want to offend people and and this parenting stuff and this adulting stuff and man this just being a human on this planet stuff it's hard yeah and so yeah that's what i would do if you're a parent buy the book put it out and never speak of it again yeah don't have it signed to the kid from the no <laughs> from no you. as nope. much as we want our authors to sign the books you know <laughs> i've i've always felt like and i know that's probably why you decided to target this audience that high school's hard middle school is the worst it's just the worst. It's everything about it. It's awkward. It's hormones. It's braces. It's everything all at it's once. Terrible independence. Yeah. Like, I, I, hmm. is that why you you chose this age group? Yes. And this this book actually. So interesting note for your readers and listeners who may be going out there looking for books for their kids. The publishing industry has this term called middle grade, mm -hmm. which is not exactly the same as middle school. So middle grade mm -hmm. readers are older than your chapter books. So they've moved on past Ivy and Bean or whatever it is they're reading. And they're not ready for YA, which are like your high school mm -hmm. level romance, fantasy, whatever it is. And so middle, middle grade books are really for kids ages 8 to 12. Mm -hmm. So what I would say to parents is if this is an issue for your 8-year-old, 9-year-old, 10-year-old, even before they're like officially in middle yeah. school, buy this book. Take them to see Inside Out 2. Oh, I was And then never talk about, about any of it. <laughs> But Inside Out too, I think does such a phenomenal job um, really showing in a very accessible and relatable way what happens during puberty, yeah. right? And middle school is when, oh, the throes of puberty is terrible. But I think not only does it do such a good job of diving deep into like the anxiety and mm -hmm. the stress of puberty, but also um, makes it relatable and also gives parents and kids a common language for talking about what's going on. Yeah. So we I would say- definitely had that. We, buy the um, book go to the movie that'll help and then just don't talk about it unless they ask yeah yeah if the um, kids bring it up or you can say you know when my kids are really struggling one of the things i learned to say is do you want me to sit with you and just be here do you want me to just listen or do you want advice yeah. and i always ask them if they want advice and if they say no natalie i bite my tongue so hard you wouldn't believe it i'm not so, good at that carla i'm so I not i've gotten better because i think you and others have given me that advice of sometimes don't don't offer just do you want me to be here but it's so hard when you know what they can do to help themselves i gotta tell you one of the most painful realities that i'm constantly reminding myself of is nobody wants unsolicited advice mm -hmm. even when it's good advice even when it's life-changing brilliant advice even when it would make their life so much easier and it is coming from a place of like the deepest love, nobody wants unsolicited advice. And I will be sitting here. I know this. I know what the issue is. I will be sitting at my computer, struggling, struggling, clicking. It's not working. My husband comes along, who I refer to as my IT department. And if I haven't asked for help and he shows up and offers help, I bite his head off every time. <laughs> Nothing about this makes sense, Natalie. It's not reasonable. And yet it is so much a part of human nature that part of our journey on this planet is to figure things out for ourselves and that is so powerful with kids and so that's why i say to parents don't hand this book to your kids because that is offering them unsolicited advice and they don't want it yeah so yeah it's rough man well and when you mentioned the the what did you call it middle eight, middle grade middle, middle grade, grade books grade eight to twelve so we are talking about fourth fifth sixth graders even yeah absolutely but one of the issues i did a podcast recently on um puberty happening so much earlier today that we yeah. probably have eight nine ten year olds going through absolutely. puberty, and we didn't used to be more middle school and that's a whole other okay. podcast <sighs> yeah but i mean just to touch on it briefly yeah so i was talking to so i have two girls who are 15 and 14 right now and I was talking to them about their periods and body odor and acne and all these things when they were 
six, seven, because A, they were curious, and B, that's the age when you can talk about these very normal, predictable, healthy bodily functions, and it's not fraught. Mm -hmm. It wasn't triggering for them. It didn't make their buttons big and bright and pushable because it was like, that's way off in the distance, mm -hmm. right? And so my like, maybe my younger daughter was five. I remember she was running around the house with like a maxi pad stuck to her forehead because she thought it was hilarious. <laughs> and so by the time they got to puberty, I mean, there were plenty of other issues that came up that were stressful and anxiety provoking, but that stuff wasn't because we had talked about it mm -hmm. when it was a time that it wasn't personal for them yet. Yeah. It, it was so funny. Can, like you said, you can it use humor. It was funny. You had, that, so like, I know what that is. Yeah. I really recommend to parents, especially of girls, but I think of boys too, to start talking about these normal body changes that happen during puberty as early as possible. Because yeah. A, like you mentioned, early puberty is more and more common. So you don't know if your child's going to get her period when she's eight years old. Yeah. Right? You don't know. And the earlier you talk about it, the easier it is. And if you are a parent who has a hard time talking about these things, go get a book, go to your library, talk yeah. to the librarian. There's a ton of really great books out there with very accurate information. And that will give you the words to and talk to your child. It's not as scary ever, if anyone's listening and they're like, oh, I don't know how much. It's really not as scary. You're more fearful yeah. of it than your kids. They're, your kids they're just going to listen. Yeah, sure. And, yeah, and they just want to know. And this is like normal body yeah. stuff. But all this other stuff and the freaking out, like you write yeah. about, happens when that starts to happen. And, and you're right about the movie. The Inside Out movie does a good job. And I thought of you in this book, in this podcast, when I yeah. saw it, because it is like it's a it's it's a good way of seeing what goes on. They, they did a good job of explaining that in the brain. Anxiety yeah. takes over. And if you haven't seen it, see it and then get the book. Um, yes. Because it's just a weird part of life that we just need to give them tools to help them through. And yeah, I feel like the goal with kids in puberty in middle school is just to get them through get it them as through. unscathed as possible. Yes. So true. I agree yeah. with you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, tell people where they can find the book and uh, um, get more information. Yeah, so the book is called How to Stop Freaking Out. It publishes on September 10th, 2024, and folks can buy it at your local independent bookseller or wherever you like to buy books online. It's available everywhere. Fantastic. Well, I'll put a link, um, give people more information for your website. Follow Carla, by the way, on social media. And I just appreciate you and your, your passion for, for helping people, helping kids. Your first book, of course, I'll put a link in for that too. Um, so thanks. Always good to talk to you. And thank you, Natalie, for everything you do to support families and um, for everything you're putting out there. It's really amazing. And I'm very grateful for you. Natalie appears to have frozen.